ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Houston and the 28th Annual Conference of the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. Now, please welcome Conference Chair, Dr. Robin Cohen. Robin Cohen, and have had the great honor of being your conference chair. I'm also living proof that not everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> I'm here to welcome you to the 28th Annual Conference for the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. We have an incredible program for you throughout the next three days. During today's plenary, we will recognize top achievers in the field of IO psychology, recognize our newest PSYOP fellows, and hear the much anticipated presidential address from Doug Reynolds. I am pleased to announce that as of this morning, we had over 3,800 people registered for the conference a number I know we're all excited about. If, awesome. <laughs> if this is your first conference, I want to extend a very warm welcome. We are thrilled to have you, and I know that this will be the first of many SIOP conferences to come. At the end of this morning's program, I will draw your attention to some of the key highlights of the program. But without further ado, for the first portion of the program, I would like to call up our awards chair, Lietta Hugh. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Robin. <laughs> before we begin, I'd like to honor the award, before we honor our award recipients, I'd like to thank the committee members of the awards committee, the chairs, there are 20 chairs for the awards committee, and I'd also like to thank the chair in training, David Baker. Will you all please stand, there's lots of you. Thank you. I know there were many more. Maybe you're embarrassed to stand. No. We have a number of award winners that we're honoring this morning. But first, let's go to last night and acknowledge the award winners that we recognized then. That's the list from last night, and let's give all of them a big applaud. <laughs> and now on to this morning's acknowledgments of winners. The S. Raines Wallace Dissertation, Dissertation Research Award is given in recognition of the best doctoral dissertation research in the field of IO psychology. The winning dissertation research must demonstrate the use of research methods that are both rigorous and creative. This year, SIAP presents the award to Dan Ispas of Illinois State University for his work titled 
the role of rater motivation in personnel selection validation studies. Dan? <laughs> Congratulations. The M. Scott Myers Award for Applied Research in the Workplace is given in recognition of a project or product representing an example of outstanding practice of IO psychology in the workplace. The award recipients are invited to make a presentation at SIAP's annual conference. The 2013 Myers Award goes to Kimberly Smith Jentz of the University of Central Florida, Dana Milanovic Coaster of the Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division, Stephanie Payne of Texas A&M University, Alicia Sanchez of the University of Central Florida, Danielle Merkett of the Naval Air Systems Command Training Systems Division, and Janice Cannon Bowers and Eduardo Salas, also the University of Central Florida, for their nine-year project, Team Dimensional Training, Guided Team Self-Correction. Will you all please come forward? Congratulations, and I think it survived the fall. <laughs> SIOP has two distinguished early career contributions awards, one for science and one for practice. The Science Early Career Contributions Award is given to an individual who has made distinguished contributions to the science of IO psychology within seven years of receiving his or her PhD. The Practice Early Career Contributions is given to an individual who has made distinguished contributions to the practice of IO psychology within 10 years of receiving his or her PhD. This year's winner in science is Russell E. Johnson of Michigan State University. In the seven years since earning his doctorate from the University of Akron, Dr. Johnson has compiled an impressive record of research activity and scholarly publications. He has 51 peer-reviewed journal articles, many in top-tier publications. His research has focused mostly on employee identity, information, implicit information processing, and core self-evaluation. His contributions in each of these areas have significantly advanced the science of IO psychology. Contributing to science also involves mentoring and training graduate students, an area where Dr. Johnson has excelled. More than half of his articles have included student co-authors, and he has already chaired more than a dozen dissertation and thesis committees. He has also played an active role in the IO community, chairing and participating in several SIOP committees, as well as serving on the editorial boards of 12 journals. Russell, congratulations. Thanks, <laughs> This year's recipient of the Distinguished Early Career Contributions Award in Practice is Alexander Alonzo of the Society of Human Resource Management, SHRM. Perhaps Dr. Alonzo's greatest impact has been in the field of human resource management. He led the development of SHRM's Elements for HR Success Competency Model, which was designed to serve as a roadmap for building proficiency as an HR professional. Prior to joining SHRM, he was part of a team of researchers involved in a medical team training intervention called Team Steps, which was designed to improve patient safety. There are hundreds of hospitals around the world that use it, and thousands of nurses, technicians, administrators, and physicians have been trained in the Team Steps program. Dr. Alonzo has undertaken numerous projects for American Institutes for Research and SHRM, 
that have had a significant impact on the practice of IO psychology. He was a major contributor to a team that created an exam, now widely used, that enabled students to demonstrate their mastery of HR learning. More recently, he has gained in, engaged in projects to engage, examine competency assessment and alternate modes of assessment. He also has been publishing regularly in our journals. Congratulations, Alex. The Distinguished Teaching Contributions Award is presented in recognition of SIOP members who demonstrate a sustained record of excellence in teaching, as evidenced by excellence in the classroom or via web-based teaching, student development, and community service via teaching. The annual award is given to an individual who has sustained experience in a full-time university or college track, tenure track, or tenured position requiring substantial teaching responsibilities. There is no restriction on the specific courses taught, only the courses concern perspectives or applications of IO psychology. Nominations of individuals who, whose primary responsibilities lie in teaching undergraduates and terminal master's students are encouraged. This year's recipient is Elizabeth Schoenfeld of Western Kentucky University. Competent, intelligent, dedicated, caring, and passionate for I.O. are among the many accolades former students have bestowed on Dr. Schoenfeld. She has directed the I.O. psychology program for 19 of her 30 years at WKU, during which time she has earned the respect and admiration of hundreds of students. Her teaching excellence is demonstrated by her breadth and depth of knowledge clarity in organization, varied and effective methods of presentation, and integration of the latest research in the courses she teaches. Her students gain a deep understanding of the value and relevance of IO psychology, theory, and practice. As a teacher, she is dedicated to fostering intellectual, professional, and personal development of individual students, and she has directed more than 80 theses. There is no greater reward than to be appreciated, and Dr. Schoenfeld's students do indeed appreciate her. Congratulations. The Distinguished Service Contributions Award is presented in recognition of sustained, significant, and outstanding service to SIOP. Service contributions can be made in a variety of ways, in ways that include, but are not limited to, serving as an elected officer of the society, the chair or member of a standing or ad hoc committee of the society, and as a formal representative of SIOP to other organizations. This year's recipient is Joan Brannock of Brannock HR Connections. For more than two decades, Dr. Brannock has dedicated much of her time and energy to advancing PSYOP and IO psychology. During that time, she has served on seven committees and chaired the awards, professional practice, and workshop committees. She is currently the professional practice officer on PSYOP's executive board. Of special note is her work on behalf of IO Psychology in chairing a task force to write and deliver PSYOP's responses to APA's Model Licensure Act, approved early in 2010. She also led the extensive effort required to ensure APA's continued recognition of IO Psychology as a specialty within the discipline. And she was a key player in APA's Future of Psychology Practice Initiatives. Award nominators noted how she is willing to take on challenging tasks, doing so effectively and with grace. In the words of one nominator, everything she touches gets better. Joan, congratulations. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> The
The Distinguished Professional Contributions Award is given to an individual who has developed, refined, and implemented practices, procedures, and methods that have had a major impact on both people in organizational settings and the profession of IO psychology. The contributions of the individual must have advanced the profession by increasing the effectiveness of IO psychologists working in business, industry, government, and other organizational settings. This year, we have two Distinguished Professional Contributions Award recipients. One is Ken Perlman, an independent consultant. With a career of remarkable achievements, Dr. Perlman is particularly known for his contributions to the application and use of validity generalization procedures, which have changed how practitioners and researchers approach selection system validation. He has also made a major impact through his work on writings on job families, job analysis, competency modeling, and the Labor, Depart Labor Department's ONET system for job description, analysis, and classification. He was an early advocate for a national occupational database and has been a tireless supporter of efforts toward ONET's improvement and enhancement. Considered an eminent work analysis expert, Dr. Perlman has been recognized for his expertise with fellow status in PSYOP, APA, and APS. He has provided significant service to the I.O. profession, serving on several panels related to the revision of both ONET and PSYOP's principles. He has authored or co-authored seven books and chapters in 18 Rough Creek Journal articles. Ken, congratulations. Our second Distinguished Professional Contribution recipient is Nancy Tippins of CEB Velterra. Recognized as being in the forefront of implementing computer-based assessment programs long before they were commonly used, Dr. Tippins has spent her career developing assessment procedures and putting into practice hiring programs, many of which have been extremely large scale, affecting thousands of applicants in some of the most visible U.S. corporations. Her work not only illuminated key issues relevant to automated assessments, but provided solutions to new questions the field was facing in using these measures. She's had extensive involvement in articulating standards for professional practice, serving on revision committees for PSYOP's principles for the development and validation of personnel selection systems, and APA's standards for educational and psychological testing and assessment. A former PSYOP president, she has also served the profession in a variety of appointed and elected roles, including several with PSYOP, APA Council, and five APA committees, as well as several national committees and professional groups. In 2004, she received SIAP's Distinguished Service Award. Nancy, <laughs> congratulations. Distinguished Scientific Contributions Award is presented in recognition of outstanding contributions to the science of IO psychology. This award is given to individuals who have made the most distinguished empirical and theoretical scientific contributions to the field of IO psychology. The recipients are invited to give an address that relates to their contributions at the following PSYOP conference next year. Wayne Cassio of the University of Colorado is this year's winner. <laughs> Dr. Cassio's research and professional activities have combined to create a very impressive body of contributions to both science and practice during his nearly 40-year career. His research in several areas, the effects of downsizing, the financial effects of HR policy and practices, the determinants and outcomes of employee turnover, performance appraisals, and international HR management 
has resulted in an exceptional number of influential books and articles that have greatly impacted both academia and business. Much of his work has focused on identifying emerging trends that have helped shape and focus the direction of research and practice in our field. He has a long history of direct involvement with corporate and public sector organizations, is a leading speaker and sought after consultant. A past president of SIAP, he has also held key leadership positions in the Sherm Foundation and the Academy of Management. His contributions to the scientific li literature have been prolific. They include 27 books, including several widely used textbooks and more than 150 journal articles and book chapters. Congratulations, Wayne. You are so special, you know that, don't you? <laughs> Let's have a really big round of applause for all of the award winners today, last night, and throughout the years. Thank you. Jerry, Jerry is the chair of the fellowship committee, and he will present the next portion of the program. Thanks, Lietta. Good morning. Society fellows are distinguished industrial and organizational psychologists who have made unusual and outstanding contributions to the field. Each year it's a particularly difficult task to select the honorees uh, for that year. And so I'd like to begin by recognizing the hard work of the fellowship committee. If uh, all of you would please stand. Great job, guys. This morning, we'd like to recognize 23 outstanding IO psychologists as PSYOP fellows. Uh, please join me in... Derek Avery has established national prominence as a scholar in the area of diversity and organizations. He has applied theory to investigate important societal questions, such as, does an organization's climate for diversity affect bottom line outcomes? And how do job applicants think about organizational diversity when considering employers? Zainab Ican is well known for both her scholarship and her efforts to promote IO psychology in Turkey and internationally. She advanced a highly influential model of culture fit which illustrates the role of cultural variables and non-cultural variables and their impact on human resource management practices. Boris Baltus is well recognized for his research on the effects of stereotypes on workplace outcomes, age and workplace issues, psychological climate, and work-family balance. His first area of focus, and that for which he may be best known, is on the role of memory perceptual bias and social stereotypes in performance evaluation. Peter Chen, who cannot be with us, is recognized internationally as an expert in occupational safety, health, and well-being. His work has bridged IO psychology with occupational safety and health and has helped introduce IO psychology to a broader audience. Baron Erdogan's research and greatest contributions focus on two main areas that are central to the field of IO psychology, leader member exchanges and work adjustment and fit. Her work on leader member exchanges is rather extensive and has expanded our understanding of how LMX develops and how it operates within and across multiple organizational hierarchical levels. Bernardo Ferdman is an internationally known scholar practitioner, and educator in the areas of diversity, inclusion, and multiculturalism. One of his unique areas of contribution concerns the operation of social and cultural identity of Latinos in the workplace. Roseanne Foti is well known for her contributions to scholarship, 
and particularly for her outstanding teaching and mentoring accomplishments. Regarding external recognition of her teaching, she was either a finalist or winner for teaching awards at Virginia Tech in eight different years. In addition, she won the 2006 PSYOP Distinguished Teaching Award. Franco Fraccaroli has been a strong influence on IO psychology in Europe as well as internationally. He has served as president of the European Association for Work and Organizational Psychology and has helped to bridge the gap between IO psychology in Italy and the rest of the world. Teresa Glom is best known for her research on psychological processes related to or resulting in affective states of people at work. Over the last 10 years, there has been an increased interest in worker-employer feelings and well-being, and she has made a substantial contribution to this important and growing area of IO psychology. Alicia Grandi has distinguished herself and made outstanding theoretical contributions to our field by advancing the study of emotional labor. Specifically, she developed a unique integrative perspective on emotional labor that synthesized prior work and developed the surface acting, deep acting distinction, showing how this distinction helps to explain the link between emotional events and individual and organizational consequences to those events. Leslie Hammer is one of the leading scholars in the fields of work family and occupational health psychology. She is a founder of the Society of Occupational Health Psychology, was elected the first president of this group, and has been instrumental in bringing together IO psychology and occupational health psychology. James LeBreton's work emphasizes the dispositional basis of job attitudes and job behavior Within this stream of research, he has used innovative approaches to measuring personality traits that are linked to various dysfunctional job attitudes and behaviors. Cynthia Lee, who cannot be with us, has made important contributions to IO psychology in the research areas of goal setting and job insecurity. Her goal setting work introduced the self-efficacy construct into the goal setting empirical studies. She has also developed programmatic research on job insecurity. Philip Levens is an internationally recognized scholar who has been the catalyst for a reconsideration of issues related to assessment center construct validity, which has been a contentious issue for decades. He has been a leading figure in research on the development and operational use of situational judgment tests which are arguably the most eagerly embraced new development in personnel selection in the last few decades. Therese Macon is recognized for her contributions to research and education. She has made outstanding contributions to our understanding of the employment interview, delving into the information and decision-making processes that determine the quality of interviewer judgments and provide clues to substantial improvements. Patrick McKay's main interest and greatest contributions have been in the area of diversity. His work on adverse impact includes an important meta-analysis on black-white mean differences in work performance, a study that included moderator variables previously not considered. Matthew O'Connell was the driving force behind the creation of an I.O. company that offers assessment solutions for all levels of an organization and has done assessments across the globe for many years. He has also made an impact on applied research using the large volume of data routinely collected by his organization internally to improve assessments. Julie Olson Buchanan has made numerous and extraordinary service contributions to PSYOP, which led to her receiving the Distinguished Service Contributions Award. Her scholarly contributions have explored the processes underlying retaliation toward grievance filers and developed a comprehensive theory integrating retaliation with the broader topic of mistreatment. Scott Opler is best known for his numerous high-quality contributions to the practice of I.O. psychology. Early on, this involved managing major facets of the Army's Project A including major responsibilities for the longitudinal validation analysis. Karen Paul has spent much of her professional career applying the science of IO psychology as an internal consultant for a Fortune 100 company. 
She has served in a number of positions and roles across her 20 plus years, including national and global selection, engagement and performance, employee surveys, and leadership development. Dan Putka has offered innovative yet practical technical contributions to a wide range of projects and has become a recognized authority in the estimation of reliability. He was also the creative force behind the Work Preferences Assessment that assesses an individual's preferences for various types of work and uses this information to determine potential fit with the Army in general and specific military occupational specialties in particular. Dirk Steiner is a recognized leader in justice research with groundbreaking research in examining cross-cultural issues in perspectives on organizational justice. He has also made important and unique contributions through his leadership of organizational psychology in France. Robert Tett is one of the most influential researchers in the study of personality in the selection context over the past two decades. One of his significant theoretical contributions is trait activation theory, which draws on interactionist theories in psychology and posits that situations differ on determinable ways in the extent to which they enable personality traits to affect job performance. One of the great things about being on the fellowship committee is that you're reminded at least once a year how many talented people uh, belong to the society. This year's group is no exception. Um, Please join me in a final round of applause for 2013 fellows. Thank you, Jerry. Our SIOP fellows are certainly an exceptional group and very deserving of recognition. And now, please welcome Milt Hackle, president of the SIOP Foundation. Um, our theme over the past several years has been building for the future, and indeed the future looks very good, especially as the market has been rising once again. Um, Larry, would you please advance the slide? Uh, so the, the foundation trustees join me in thanking you for your contributions to our, uh, our work, uh, to our bottom line most particularly. Uh, in December it stood at 2,370,000. Uh, today I will announce a new venture that's an additional gift of $50,000. Uh, our cumulative grants, awards, and scholarships, and so on are 395,000. When you join us in Hawaii next year, we will be over that 400,000 mark, uh, help make that happen. Uh, so far, there have been 93 winning groups and individuals. And now there is a new award coming online called the HRM Impact Award Program. Uh, please point your cell phone toward this web address or go to this URL as soon as you possibly can. Uh, nominations, applications are now open for uh, the HRM Impact Award. This is the first time it will be given. When you get to that website, you will see it is a collaborative effort of the SIOP Foundation, SIOP, SHRM, and the SHRM Foundation. The idea for the award actually originated in the plenary session in, uh, two years ago. Uh, in which Howard Klein from Ohio State sat and listened to the awards, the fellows, the collaboration here and said, well, maybe there ought to be some way of putting the Sherm Foundation together with the SIOP Foundation and now it has happened. This is a dry award, it carries no cash prize, but it will carry bragging rights. And we are a relatively small group, even though we think we're so, so big and so crowded, so many of us, and it's lovely to see everybody here. But at our most, we're about 8,000 people. SHRM is a quarter of a million people worldwide. The SHRM are the, is the consumer for so much of the evidence-based practice that we explore, recommend, develop, implement. And this is a chance to recognize those kinds of projects. My personal hope is that the awards committee gets deluged with nominations, 100 or more. Actually, we're looking for one good one. 
to give this award to, it will happen uh, in October of this year at a SHRM conference and then at the SIOP Leading Edge Consortium. Uh, so go visit the website, download the application, fill it out, send it in. We want lots of documentation of evidence-based practice and to reward that. Uh, so go do it. That's your assignment, your homework. Uh, your next assignment is to look for people wearing the SIOP Scholars pin. Uh, these are investigators, uh, new professionals, new uh, academicians uh, who have won awards from SIOP. We have had 123 last year. We added 10 more to the group last night. Uh, and here to talk about uh, the importance of uh, mentorship in bringing us all along. We all had mentors. I'd like to introduce Leslie Joyce. You've seen her name in connection with the Joyce Thayer. Uh, oh, what is it? Fellowship. Fellowship, <laughs> yes. Leslie. Thank, thank you, Milt. Good morning. Seven years ago, I um, founded the Joyce Thayer Fellowship for um, IO Psychology's interested in a career in applied and practical settings. I did that in honor of two people who have had an enormous impact on my life, both personally and professionally. One of those is my father, who was a huge supporter of academic achievement and, and contribute greatly to my career in academics. Um, the other is Paul Thayer, who um, shepherded me through a, um, a very rigorous graduate school program, um, and we survived that process and have been friends for almost 30 years. So um, in honor of Paul and my father, um, I wanted to take just a moment to invite each one of you to think about who in your life has had the same profound impact on you, both personally and professionally. And take a second to think about how proud they would be if you could take the time to make a small donation to the SIOP Foundation in their honor. This is a group, this is a foundation that is here for all, each and every one of us, and we all benefit when each of us pays it forward just a little bit. Thank you. And you can make those contributions when you pay your dues. The dues renewal cycle starts soon. Uh, so you can do that online. You can go to the website, whatever. Uh, I mentioned a minute ago uh, a new award, Dick Generat, who you know for the Generat Award uh, on, on uh, group and assessment, uh, has also given a new contribution to the foundation. It is for the Generat Symposium. Uh, this will be organized by the foundation by a steering committee in the coming year, and it will be uh, to establish a test of a kind of prototype for field research consortia. In the history of work in organizational psychology, industrial psychology, there have been many field collaborative efforts that have put practitioners and researchers from universities together to solve problems of common interest. And so unlike an ordinary symposium, this Generet Symposium will explore questions that practitioners would love to have answered now rather than questions that flow naturally necessarily from theory, but bringing the rigor of theory and analysis and quantitative methods and research design uh, when I was editor of Personnel Psychology, I heard often that there are tons of data out in the field. How do we mine that? How do we bring intelligence, good explanations out of that? The Generet Symposium will uh, examine some questions in that area, pick a focal one that might be examined within a five-year time frame, and then attempt to establish a field research consortium. This honors the scientist practitioner uh, kind of cycle, uh, history lesson, Aristotle, the ancient Greeks, uh, three types of knowledge in terms of theoria, poiesis, and praxis. Praxis is oriented toward action, and it really is the continuing cycle of reconceptualizing the meanings of what we learn from our experience. We have some very highly articulated, sophisticated development ways of learning from experience with research designs and quantitative analysis, and we bring that to bear on evidence-based practice. It really forms the heart of the scientist-practitioner uh, kind of philosophy, the model, 
And so this will take us one step further from what you will hear on counted times in this convention, namely more research is needed. We will be putting some focus on that, looking at what can be learned within some circumscribed area, trying to launch a field consortium and see how that works. There will be an independent evaluation group to look at it. If this works out well, we hope that it will lead to a series of praxis consortia that get established around lots of different topics in the field. So please join me in thanking Dick Genrette, who is not here this morning, but for his contribution and leadership in this area to help us explore how we can become more effective at generating applicable knowledge. We are building for the future, let's do it. It's just a floating head. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Milt. All right. <laughs> Much better, right? <laughs> I have the distinct honor of introducing SIOP President Doug Reynolds. <laughs> so, the introduction is a chance for us to get to know more about Doug and to have a little bit of fun. Right. So let's learn more about Doug Reynolds. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so in preparing this introduction, I talked to a lot of Doug's colleagues, and everyone loves Doug. Good is what you think of when you think of Doug. And I wish I could share all the, all the quotes that I received from his many colleagues, but then Doug would never get a chance to talk. But I do want to share this one from George Thornton, um, who was one of Doug's professors at Colorado State. George had this to say about Doug. Bright, strong in all subject areas, serious, hard worker, outstanding performer, good at scholarship and practice, supportive colleague all those attributes that let us see he would be highly successful in our field. Over the last year, I have seen all of these attributes in Doug and more. He has been a superb steward of PSYOP and a great mentor to me. Thank you, Doug. In fact, I have come to think of Doug as a Lincoln-like figure fully committed to preserving the union between scientist and practitioner. But then to others, Doug is simply known as that gluten-free guy. <laughs> Doug went to graduate school at Colorado State. There he was known as GQ student. As described by Jan Cleveland, Doug had wavy soft hair, a gorgeous complexion, and a very preppy yet casual dress style. <laughs> what young co-ed would not adore him? Let's take a closer look at this tattoo. <laughs> Always an early adapter, Doug had a tattoo long before they became trendy or popular. But of course, not just any tattoo. A tattoo designed to increase PSYOP's visibility, <laughs> something Doug has been working on a long time. And when Doug became president, he actually threw down the gauntlet to all former presidents, challenging them to get one of these tattoos. <laughs> so rumor has it that Paul Thayer has one, <laughs> Kevin Murphy, and Anne Marie Ryan. <laughs> Gary Latham said he would get one, but only if Ed Locke did. <laughs> but I know for a fact of one person who has one, Dave Nershi, our executive director. <laughs> Dave will do anything for PSYOP. In 1989, Doug went to work for Humro, where he was involved in Project A. Doug's colleagues at Humro had many fantastic things to say about Doug. 
They were also very helpful. They sent out a call for pictures that I could use in Doug's introduction. So one day I receive an email that says, incriminating photos of Doug. I said, thank goodness, finally I'm going to get something juicy on this guy. Well, here's, here it is. There's Doug. There's a turtle. Maybe there was something special between Doug and the turtle. I don't know. Not even I was going to go there. So in 1996, Doug left Humro and went to work for DDI, where he is currently Vice President of Assessment Technology. At DDI, here you see his GQ stylings again, um, where he shares a penchant for innovation with his lookalike Steve Jobs. Audrey Smith, Doug's manager at DDI, told me that soon after Doug joined DDI, one of the execs who didn't know Doug labeled him Clark Kent on his way to finding his Superman. <laughs> he soon found his Superman, and he has not lost him since. <laughs> Many people commented on Doug's logical approach to problems. Chris Rotolo, who closely collaborated with Doug on the branding initiative, had this to say. Doug's calmness in the face of uncertainty and complexity is very comforting. Doug always takes a logical versus emotional perspective. Those of us on the executive board certainly have appreciated Doug's logical approach over the last year. However, we think he may have gone a little too far by closing every board meeting with his own take on the Vulcan salute. Live long and support PSYOP. Sorry. You see, he's got it. <laughs> but enough about good Doug. So you really have to be a bit, bit of a badass to rock a feather boa like that, wouldn't you say? <laughs> but it gets worse. Doug has seen his share of trouble with the law. This is really Doug assuming the position on a police car here. Well, you may be wondering what led up to this scene. I have pictures. It began innocently enough. Here Doug is with his fellow graduate students preparing for a Kevin Murphy exam, which apparently required alcohol. <laughs> and then here's Doug throwing up outside of Kevin Murphy's office. And here's Doug putting on a disguise after he realized he could one day be PSYOP president. <laughs> but it was only after he put on the bee costume that things got out of hand. <laughs> what were you thinking, Doug? <laughs> and what about the ugly? Yes, Doug can do ugly, too. Doug is a gifted athlete. He played hockey for many years. At age 30, after a vicious check into the boards, Doug broke his back, and he was in a brace for four months. But he did return to the ice, and here you see him seeking revenge. <laughs> you do not mess around with the guy known as the Velvet Hammer. <laughs> back to the good. Doug is a loving son, a devoted father to sons Caleb and Sam, an adoring spouse to Jennifer, his college sweetheart, who he has known for over 30 years. In Jennifer's words, Doug takes care of everyone and everything. Jennifer, Doug, Jennifer, and your sons want you to know that they love you very much and they're very proud of you. Superman indeed. Doug is incredibly accomplished. He is an outstanding, award-winning consultant, the author of two books, and has over 150 chapters, articles, presentations, and technical reports. He has over 25 years of exemplary service to PSYOP in a variety of roles. He is one of the foremost experts in our field on the integration of assessment and technology. Finally, one of my favorite quotes about Doug came from Audrey Smith, who remarked, we all wish we had an invisible Doug on our shoulder. Ladies and gentlemen, PSYOP President, 
Doug Reynolds. came from. You know, I've known that that was coming for a year, and I tried to hide all of the incriminating evidence. Somehow, the bee suit got by me. Uh, I think I have my wife to blame for that one. Thank you, Tammy. I wanted to start today uh, by asking you to think a little bit about the first time you heard about IO psychology as something that you might pursue as a career option. Think about that moment and how you heard about it and who influenced you. Now, unless you were a child at the, at the time, you probably remember it. And just out of curiosity, uh, there's probably a few here that did hear the field as a child. I'm thinking maybe the people who were second generation IO psychologists. Does anybody want to be an IO psychologist when they're a kid? I, I actually don't see anybody at all. I, <laughs> I thought there'd be somebody. Well, I want to start today by telling you a little bit about how I discovered IO psychology. I didn't want to be an IO psychologist as a kid. I wanted to be a lawyer, and then I ended up in uh, small claims court in high school, and Tammy didn't get that story, good thing. Uh, but I changed my mind after that. I didn't want to be a lawyer, and never wanted to be a lawyer again. But let me tell you about how I discovered IO psychology. I discovered IO psychology at an inpatient mental health facility. I was on my way to something else. As I prepared this talk, I realized it was exactly 30 years ago last month. I was a junior in college, majoring in psychology with a concentration in neuroscience. I loved the science, but I didn't care much for spending my days in the lab or the pervasive smell of the chemicals that we used. I liked the idea of applying psychology to something that I could see. I liked to see the result of my work. I liked to have a positive impact. So at the time, I thought, that that would mean I should pursue a career on the healthcare side of psychology. So it was spring break of that year, and I was doing a week-long experiential learning project, shadowing a counselor at a mental health facility just outside of Philadelphia. It was on Thursday of that long week that a clinical psychologist on the staff sensed my growing misery and he offered to talk to me about alternative options in the field of psychology. I don't recall his name, but I owe him greatly for our conversation that day. He asked me about my interests and what I liked about psychology, and he suggested maybe I should learn a little bit more about I.O. He helped me find a pearl in an oyster that week, and that one conversation led me towards a path that I'm still exploring. So that's how I discovered IO psychology. Think for a moment about how you were introduced to the field and who influenced you. And I'll come back to this point. One of the first tasks that you need to do as PSYOP president is pick a theme for the coming year. I did this a year ago. And I, I picked the theme extending our influence. So I want to tell you a little bit about why I think this is important for PSYOP and for the profession at large. I started by looking at the words that we have agreed upon in the past. It was about six or seven years ago uh, where we established our mission, our vision, and our goals. Our mission talks about promoting our science and our practice. Our vision suggests that we should be recognized for our work. And our goals point us towards the need to be visible and advocates and champions of our field to others. So there's a red thread running through these words. They all have to do with a relationship between us and those who are not part of the field. I took this as an obligation to extend the influence of the field. 
And this is where I pulled the theme from. The theme focused me on projects that helped us to advance our influence. And as we worked on these projects, a sub-theme emerged. And I'll note, you'll note that the sub-theme is of identity is also echoed in this talk today. So some might ask, well, not yet. Some might ask why we need to extend our influence. Is it because IO psychologists are naturally attention-seeking people? I think not. I think it stems from our interest in applied science. We like to see our work make a difference. And we get frustrated when policies and practices are set without any consideration for what really works. Inevitably, this happens not because people disagree with us, but more often because they don't know us. So, we track member survey data pretty frequently. And when we ask about things like this conference and our journals and publications and our website, we get very high satisfaction ratings on those vehicles. But when we ask about satisfaction with promoting the field outside of I.O. to business and policymakers, the public at large, our satisfaction is far lower. So if we really wanted to make a difference in that result, I think we need to take on three challenges. Consider these as steps for extending our influence. These three challenges form the structure of my talk today. And I'll highlight some of the projects that are underway to meet these challenges. Let's first look at a series of projects that are focused on how we should brand ourselves as a society and as a profession. Now, we're all familiar with the concept of branding from the companies that spend millions building an association between a name or a shape and an attribute like quality, fitness, or innovation. Professional associations like PSYOP need to manage their brand too, and there's a process for how you go about doing that. To simplify it, I think of branding as three activities. First, you need to define who you are and what you stand for. This is, in part, a question of identity. Second, you need to present these things, you need to present these ideas with things like logos, taglines, website design, things that are simple and easy to grasp. And third, you need to continually focus on defining target audiences for your message. There have been several studies in this initiative over the past 10 years that to look at things like the key attributes of IO psychologists. Now to oversimplify their findings a bit, these studies tend to show two things about us. First, I our field is very diverse. But second, we share many common attributes. Let me say more about the dilemma this raises for building our brand. Just about any conversation about how to represent PSYOP tends to generate disagreements about what parts of the field should be reflected. If you approach the question from the perspective of what we study, the level of analysis we prefer, or the settings we work in, you can't reflect all these dimensions with a simple statement that we can agree on. On the other hand, when these studies looked at our interests, our values, and our aspirations, we found far more consistency. This makes sense to me. I shared the story in the beginning about how I discovered IO psychology, not because it's unique to me, but because it's incredibly common. Most of us discovered this field on the way to somewhere else. Along the way, we were influenced by something or somebody, and these interests, values, and aspirations caught our attention. These findings across our branding studies resonated well with the task force, and they put them into four categories that you see here, and this starts a uh, journey towards our brand enhancement. The next step is figure, to figure out how to represent these concepts in a new way. Now, what you see here is our current logo, our current tagline, and our website design. They should look familiar. They have served us well. 
but I did want to point out a problem that they have. These things tend to work like a mirror. We see ourselves somewhere in these symbols, and we understand what's intended. But they don't communicate well to those outside the field. If we want to extend our influence to key audiences, we'll need to understand their perspectives and present ourselves in a manner that they are prepared to understand. That is, instead of working like a mirror, these symbols should operate more like a window. And to do this, we need to get input from our target audiences. We need to pick the elements that resonate best, and these are the next steps in the project that I'm describing. We're not quite there yet, but they're drafts that are being piloted with external groups in the coming weeks. I did want to give you an informal sneak preview, though. What you see here on the left side is our current tagline. And you might see that replaced with the examples on the right side. Some of these are clearly better than others. <laughs> now, people in the back are probably wondering, why did he put that in green font? That's so small, I can't even see it, can't get the joke, geez. Well, let me tell you where you can get more information. Out in the hall, you're going to see a poster like this, and it's going to describe all the different steps that have taken place over the past literally decade uh, to look at issues of our brand. Uh, there's a link at the end of that poster that you can go to that will give you examples of all the taglines that I just showed and some other ones, as well as some draft logos. So if you're interested in this, log on, give us your opinions, and especially tell us why you feel the way you do about the examples that you see there. When you do that, I want you to keep one thing in mind, though. And that is, I don't, I, I don't want you to get caught in the same dilemma that we surfaced in this branding work. We need to find ways to think about these dimensions in a manner that does not get bound up in what we do and where we do it. Don't focus on one end or the other of these continua, but rather think of the whole scale at once. Let me give you an example of what I mean by simplifying this a bit and picking on one of our favorite issues to talk about. So I was reflecting on this dilemma with a friend recently, and I said, you know, if, you, if we pull our brand too far over towards the science side, we end up sounding a whole lot like the Academy of Management. But if we push too far to the right, we start to sound like we're part of SHRM. So the person I was talking to commented and said, you know, we could say something about scientists, practitioners, but maybe a more practical way to think about this is that PSYOP is about scientists who care about practice and practitioners that care about science. I thought that was a really good example of how to account for both ends of the continuum at once. So I have about scientists who care about practice, practitioners that care about science. The other thing to remember is that these dichotomies don't matter very much. If our goal is to extend our influence to audiences that don't really know us. If you look at it like this, the key question becomes, how do we best communicate to the left side of the distribution, to those that don't need us, but who, need, who don't know us, but need to? The work with the Branding Task Force shows that only about one in five of the folks in these groups that we think should know us actually do. We're talking about folks like HR professionals and business executives. Only one in five know who we are. So when we look at examples for how we might refine our brand, think about the need to be more like a window to these folks than like a mirror to ourselves. Before I leave this topic, I wanted to recognize Chris Rotolo and his large team of contributors and collaborators for all the work that they've done over the past year and will be doing in the next couple of months. The second step for raising our influence 
is to engage our partners and to expand our network. If you think of PSYOP as a node on a large network of organizations, many of whom have similar objectives, you can see how many of them can help us achieve our goal of being more influential. In the past decade or so, SIAP has built many formal partnerships with other organizations. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I did want to touch on a few that you might know less about. The Alliance was established in partnership with other IO societies around the world to provide a global presence for IO psychology. ASPPB is a key partner for helping us navigate the complicated issues of licensure and how to ensure state regulations make sense for IO psychologists. We're now a UN-sanctioned NGO. This allows us to contribute recommendations on economic and social issues to the United Nations. FABS is a coalition of sciences that helps us advocate for science funding at the federal level. And we all know SHRM. This past year, as Milt just mentioned, we work with them to establish a new award program for excellence in evidence-based practice. And let me share one other partnership that we worked on over this past year. Last year at this conference, EEOC Chair Berrien joined us to give a theme, note, a, a theme track keynote address. And following her presentation, we met with EEOC representatives regarding how we might begin a dialogue about contemporary selection practices. The EEOC has been very receptive. We now have a group looking at how we might engage in a dialogue on such topics as advancements in adverse impact measurement and the transportation of validity evidence. The outcomes of this collaboration will be designed to help employers understand current science and practices and be published in accessible formats such as fact sheets or webinars. As we do more to advocate for our field, we need help navigating the complexities involved. We met with science advocacy experts in Washington a couple of months ago to discuss how we might get better at this activity. Here's a summary of their advice. They said, too many organizations start by using practices on the left side of this chart to advocate for their fields before they learn to be more effective and move to the practices on the right side. Now, it's very tempting to show off what you do and the results that you've generated, but these tactics typically only attract Capitol Hill interns who come for the refreshments at your events. We need to start on the right side by developing an advocacy strategy to identify our allies, what they're trying to accomplish, and how we can use our science and skills to help them. We have a point of view on critical issues of broad interest. We just need to let the right people know that we're here to help. There are several things that we're doing to help advance SIAP's efforts in this area. We established an external relations committee a couple years ago, and now we're developing plans for each of our partnerships so we can be focused in these efforts. We're appointing a new advocacy team and looking into hiring a DC-based advocacy partner to help us navigate to places where we can have a greater influence. The first two steps I've covered today involve things that PSYOP can be doing to extend the influence of our field. The last topic I'll focus on is what you can be doing. And that's really about finding ways to make our field bigger by expanding on what we consider to be the domain of IO psychology. I'm going to give two examples of what we can be doing here to expand our boundaries. The first example is about big data, or HR analytics. Now, you've probably all heard about this by now, so this isn't necessarily new news. Pick up a copy of the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, Forbes Magazine, and you're going to see headlines like the ones that I'm showing here. Many of you are probably thinking that this is a fad. And I agree, it has all the hallmarks of a fad. But there's a significant opportunity here that we need to get in front of before we get behind on big data. Let me explain a little bit of where this concept comes from. We're all familiar with HR processes that look like this. And over the past 15 years or so, 
all of these processes have become facilitated by software, shown here as these gold circles. Each one has their own database. So here's what's new. These software companies are adding value to the process by connecting these elements together. They'd love it if they had their clients purchasing all of these subsystems from just one supplier. So as an enticement, they are building the capability to pool all the data from those subsystems into one big database. From there, it's possible to run analyses and reports that add insight into talent management. That is, if you can make sense of all the data. Now organizations are coming to grips with the difficulty of dealing with these huge and messy data sets. Just understanding the data structure is challenging, let alone pulling meaningful results from it. If only there were experts who could analyze and model complex relationships, who have an understanding of people, who could build and test theories without being distracted by spurious correlations at every turn, who can communicate findings clearly so action can be taken. I think we know a few people like this. Let me share a brief example from DDI's work. Now, maybe we should call this medium-sized data because I don't think 8,000 really qualifies as big anymore. But we recently pulled data from across a number of our clients that were measuring similar things with assessment centers. And we looked at performance across executives that were put in simulations that demanded very specific executive behaviors. And what we're finding is that many of the executives in the sample show very strong managerial skills, as you might expect from experienced managers. Things like decision making and driving for results and customer focus. It's very common to be strong in these things. A much smaller group excelled in strategic skills, such as setting direction and building the right talent to help get you there. As other databases are connected to this, we can peel back this question even further. We can look at the factors that help you develop the more difficult skills and ask whether or not it varies by the size of the company, the industry, the types of leadership experiences you've had, or even your personality profile. Data like these help organizations manage their talent better, but they also help us understand the drivers of these important skills at a deeper level. So don't take my word for it. Look at, look at some of the experts. This is a quote from a very well-known HR industry analyst, and he had this to say about how to make progress and the complexities of big data in the HR realm. There's something for all of us in this trend. Think about how you can promote what you do in the context of big data. Executives are listening. They want to make this work. They want more of it, and we can help. Don't dismiss this opportunity as a fad. Figure out how to make it part of your research and your practice. Let's not get behind the economists on this opportunity. The second opportunity I wanted to leave you with is the emerging emphasis on pro-social applications of our work. I became interested in this topic after attending a session on humanitarian work psychology several years ago. This is how we defined pro-social I.O. when we asked about it in a membership survey a couple of years ago. We found that 25% of us are actively engaged right now in projects that are applying I.O. to charitable causes. This is higher than I had guessed, but note that we do lag behind some other professions. The lawyers are beating us handily at this. Signs of this emerging area are increasingly prevalent in our books, conference sessions, and newsletters. Pro-social science and practice is already part of our field. The challenge is how to best nurture and grow this aspect of our work so that it's a regular part of what it means to be an IO psychologist. Here's an example project that just got underway this year. This program pairs SIOP volunteers with returning veterans who are seeking civilian employment. Now, many of these folks had never had to apply for a job in their lives. They're always assigned to their next position. So we're helping vets to translate their military skills 
into civilian language for their resumes and working with them to build their interviewing skills. In partnership with two veterans organizations, we're embarking on a pilot program to assist with this national issue. And the initial returns on the value of these conversations for the veterans has been very positive. The opportunity here is not just to support programs like this one, but also to nurture and support others like it. These projects are already happening, but not many of us know about them. So if you're involved in a pro-social project, consider sharing the details and, invi and, in and inviting others to help. To facilitate this, we're building a new component to our website devoted to describing active projects and describing how you can provide, how you can get more information, and how you can get involved. The site will include methods for sharing tools and results so others can benefit from your experience. By extending our influence in this area, we'll stretch our skills in new ways, as well as create opportunities to raise the visibility of the field. If you want to see the work of IO psychologists publicized more broadly, this is an easy path for making that happen. This opportunity brings me back to the concept of identity. Now, you may have heard the stereotype of our field as servants of power. Now, personally, I've never really thought about that as anything than a minor occupational hazard. But involvement in pro-social projects addresses this perception directly. When we introduce the field to others, we should reflect context for our work ranging from the Fortune 500 to organizations like the one you'll hear about in our Saturday closing keynote. It's a high school just a few miles from here that uses corporate partnerships and a novel work study program to fuel an extremely successful platform for educating underprivileged kids. Today, I've described three challenges for IO psychology if we want to extend our influence. These challenges apply to each of us, not just to our society. If we're serious about expanding our influence, we each need to consider how these challenges apply to our personal situations. We need to think about how we represent ourselves, how to develop a common brand. This will mean learning from the results of the branding studies and avoiding the distraction of the differences between us. Focusing more on the commonalities in our interests, our values, and our aspirations when we communicate about the field to others. We need to worry less about having people recognize us for the value we think we bring and instead find out more about who our partners might be and how we can best help them achieve the goals with our expertise. We might also need to be willing to pursue a fad now and then, such as the huge opportunity with big data, or find ways to give some of our skills away to those that can use them most. As we take on these challenges and pursue these opportunities, I'm convinced that our influence will, will grow. We have a very receptive audience if we package our work in a way that people are prepared to hear. We all found this field on the way to somewhere else. There are many others who need to know the work that we do. We each have an obligation to help others see the connections between their goals and the value we have to offer through our science and our practice. You never know when even a short conversation might provide a pearl of wisdom for someone who needs to know about us. I'll conclude today with a word of thanks to those who shared more than a few pearls of IO wisdom with me over the years. First my advisors, mentors, and peers at Colorado State when I was there in the 80s. The years I worked at Humro had a big impact on me, thanks to my colleagues at the time, just a few of whom you see pictured here. Now I've been at DDI so long, they take up two slides. My friends, colleagues, and mentors. mentors at DDI continue to be a great influence on me as do all the IO psychologists in my department, the assessment technology group. Now, we'd be here all day if I thanked all the people I've come to know just through PSYOP alone. These relationships have had a huge impact on me, but there are a few people in particular 
that took on special projects this year, and I wanted to acknowledge them for all their efforts, too. And of course, I want to thank the SIOP board and Tammy Allen, who've done so much to help this year. Finally, no presidential address is, out, is complete without acknowledging the support and patience of family members who tolerate just one more email before a family event or weekends and evenings when I just wasn't there. So many thanks to my wife, Jennifer, and my sons, Sam and Caleb. It's been a pleasure, an honor, and an exciting challenge to serve as your president this year. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Doug. That was fantastic. We now have a special awards presentation from the Feder Federation of Associations and Behavioral and Brain Sound Sciences Foundation. The FABS Foundation was formed to advance the public's understanding of the sciences of mind, brain, and behavior. Its sister organization, FABS, conducts advocacy on behalf of 22 scientific societies in Washington, D.C., including SIOP. The purpose of the FABS Foundation Early Career Investigator Award is to recognize scientists who have made major research contributions to the sciences of mind, brain, and behavior. We are very pleased to present this year's award to none other than Mo Wang. Mo, please come forward. I'm now pleased to announce our newly elected members of the executive board. Elected to serve as professional practice officer, Christina Banks. <laughs> elected to serve as instructional and educational officer, Laura Coppas Bryan. <laughs> elected to serve as external affairs officer, you know him, you love him, Milt Hackle. And elected to serve as your president-elect, Jose Cortina. Congratulations to each of you. Now I'd like all the members of our executive board and our committee chairs to please stand. Let's give our leadership team a round of applause. I also want to remind everyone about our upcoming Leading Edge Consortium. It will be held October 18th and 19th in Richmond, Virginia. This is our ninth annual consortium, and this year's topic is Building Future Leaders, Innovations and Trends in Talent Management. We presented an LEC on talent management several years ago, and it was very successful. We know this is an important topic right now and that it's one of great interest to our members. So we expect this year's event to be successful as well. The general chair, we're very fortunate to have the general chair, Jeff McHenry. And the rest of the LEC 2013 committee consists of Erica DeRochers, Michelle Donovan, David Oliver, Robert Schmieder, Christopher Rotolo, and Suzanne Sacomas. So mark your calendars now for the LEC. Also, it is not too early to begin thinking about our 29th annual conference, which will take place in beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, next May. Planning is already in the works, and it is sure to be another successful and popular meeting. We are very excited about this location and hope to see you all there, so prepare and make your travel plans early. But we are here now for the 2013 conference, and right now I'd like to call Robin Cohen back up for some final brief comments. Two little people. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. Although I am sure you've all read about what's in store for you, I'd like to take just a few minutes to point out some highlights of the conference. 
If you haven't already, make sure you take a look at SIOPS Mobile Planner. Through this site, you can access the conference program and create your own schedule that works with the one you created on MySIOP, on SIOP.org. The address is m.conference.siop.org, or you can scan one of the QR codes you see around the conference and in various conference publications. You can also find continuing coverage of the conference throughout the week on SIOP's Facebook and Twitter. Find out more at www.siop.org slash social media. As Doug mentioned in his address, please take some time this week to view our SIOP branding poster out in the Wi-Fi lounge. The poster, along with the accompanying exhibitor's showcase session, will provide a good deal of information about what SIOP is doing right now to improve our brand as well as what members can expect over the coming year. I'm sure you'll all agree this is a very exciting initiative. We have an incredible and diverse lineup of peer-reviewed sessions submitted by you, our members, as well as some special invited addresses and a great theme track. You can only imagine how much hard work, perseverance, patience, and energy it takes to put together the SIOP program. Your program chair this year has been Eden King. Eden, along with Deborah Rupp, who is our past program chair and incoming program chair, Evan Sinar, have worked very hard and volunteered their time to coordinate the program for us. I know Deb's not here, but if Eden and Evan could please stand. <laughs> and finally, for those of you who are planning to leave before the closing plenary, I strongly suggest that you change your flight. <laughs> we are in for a very, very special treat. Father T.J. Martinez, founding president of the Cristo Rey Jesuit High School here in Houston, will he be here to tell us his amazing story. And I can assure you, you will walk away motivated, inspired, and ready to think about how SIOP can do more for all the communities in which we live and work. This concludes our opening session. Have a great conference.